In this video on animal development, we're going to figure out how do we go from this to this. It's a miracle, really, to go from two cells that are haploid to a fully functional organism with all of its many differentiated cells and organs. It's a lot to go through, but we're going to figure it out. The first step is to get from here, the gametes, to our first cell, the zygote. Two diploid gametes to one haploid, or two haploid gametes to one diploid zygote. To get there, we're going to have to understand the fertilization event. How did these two gametes fuse to form the first cell of the new organism, the zygote? From the zygote, we're going to go through a, a stage of cleavage where we increase the number of cells, but we don't over increase the overall volume of the organism, resulting in a hollow ball of cells. From there, we're going to go through a process of, a, of invagination or folding in to form a gastrula, and we're going to talk about our different germ layers that arise by that process. So that's what we're headed for. Let's get into the steps. We need to start at fertilization. Let's look at an individual sperm cell. We know that the sperm, from our last discussions on reproduction, is not bringing a lot to the fertilization event. It's bringing a nucleus with half the genetic information that we need. It's got an acrosome, a vesicle filled with digestive enzymes. It's loaded up full of mitochondria to power its action. But it's not bringing a lot of other stuff. That's okay. The eggs can provide the other stuff for the beginning of our cell when we get up and going. The cell has a lot of extra cytoplasmic um, materials uh, to get our, our new uh, zygote uh, up and running when once we have fertilization. So let's look what happens when the sperm gets to the egg. When the sperm gets to the egg, it's got a couple barriers to get through. It's got an outer jelly member, membrane to get through, a glycoprotein vitalin layer, which we see in purple here, and then finally we get down to the cell membrane. So to get to that, uh, we can see that when the sperm engages the egg, it releases digestive enzymes that start to burrow through this jelly layer on the outside. When the uh, sperm cell comes in contact with the outer membrane, uh, the cellular membrane, it causes a very uh, depolarization in the cell membrane. The egg cell uh, membrane depolarizes and all of its endoplasmic reticulum start to release uh, calcium ions. And a wave of calcium ions results in what's called the cortical reaction, where these cortical granules are released uh, from the cell and push the vitalin layer, this glycoprotein layer, out away from the cell membrane, creating a fertilization envelope. Now, two things are going on here. When the sperm contacts the jelly layer and dissolves through, uh, the acrosomal reaction releasing the enzymes, the contact with the cell membrane, and the fusion, this fusion, the depolarization that occurs, this change in voltage across the cell membrane, is called fast blocked polyspermy. Polyspermy mini sperm. We want to ensure that only one sperm cell or one sperm nuclei enters the egg. This depolarization of the, of the cellular membrane prevents more sperm from entering the cell. The wave of calcium release across the cell, mem across the cell as this occurs leading to the cortical reaction which leads to the fertilization envelope is called slow block of polyspermy. Let's look at the pictures. Here's one second before fertilization, and the white dots represent the kind of the distribution of calcium ions. Ten seconds after fertilization, we see an increase in calcium ions at the point of fertilization, and then it, that uh, a wave of calcium ions flows across the membrane. We see that in the drawing down here, a wave of calcium ions. In this photograph, we can see how that results in this uh, barrier this fertilization envelope that basically seals off the uh, ovum, the egg, from any other sperm entering. Here we see a photograph of a sperm uh, entering an egg cell, uh, getting to the jelly layer, and here we see an amazing photograph of many sperm uh, basically attacking this egg, and uh, once one of them makes contact with the cell membrane, it's going to block the entry of all these other sperm. Uh, let's look at this diagram 
shows us kind of the timeline of the events uh, from second, you know, including seconds and minutes. And we can see that uh, within seconds of binding to the cell membrane, uh, there's a depolarization uh, of the plasma membrane that acts as a fast block to, to many, to more than one sperm entering. And within 10 seconds, we have an increase in intracellular calcium levels, which results in the cortical reaction forming the uh, fertilization membrane. This acts as slow block to polyspermy. Um, within minutes of the um, sperm cell entering the egg, we get an increase in protein synthesis as the egg is gearing up uh, for a growth stage uh, after fusion, after fertilization, as we start to build many cells from the one. And it takes 20 minutes from the time that the sperm nuclei enters the egg for the sperm nucleus and the egg nucleus to fuse. And then another 20 minutes for the onset of the first round of uh, DNA synthesis. And then by an hour and a half, we have our first cell division. So we've gone from two gametes to one zygote to two cells within an hour and a half. Now one of the amazing things to think about is after these two cells fuse and we end up with one cell, a zygote, every cell that comes from that cell is genetically identical. Every one of these cells is the same from a genetic standpoint. Yet, how do we end up with this? This organism with many different types of cells, muscle cells, bone cells, nerve cells, fat cells, skin cells, and the complex organs that they're built from. How does one cell that's genetically, uh, in a, or a ball of cells that are genetically similar, end up being so different? Well, it turns out that from the very first cell division, the cells that make up this ball of cells are already starting to become different. They're starting to differentiate. In the first stages of cell division, called the cleavage stage, the first stage of animal development, cleavage, the large zygote starts to divide into smaller cells. Here we see the four cell, sa the four cell stage and then the morula and the blastula. But even when we divide these first couple of divisions, uh, each of these four cells isn't necessarily exactly alike. Now they're exactly alike in genetic content, but they're not necessarily uh, exactly alike in other um, content. Uh, let me pause here while I, and I draw some things for you. Now if we go back to this, I've added stuff. It doesn't matter what stuff. Red stuff, blue stuff, green stuff, black stuff. This is the other cellular um, components of, of the cell, the other cytoplasmic determinants. In other words, maybe it's stockpiles of proteins or, or organelles. Now if we divide this egg, uh, or this fertilized egg now, on the first division, and we say cut it in half right there, we can see that the two sides aren't the same. This side has a lot of blue and a lot of green. This side has a lot of red and a lot of black. And then if we divide it again, we could see that while each of these cells is going to have genetically the same content, a nucleus of uh, a copied DNA, the other stuff in each of these cells is different. In other words, the cytoplasmic determinants are saying that this cell over here is already becoming different from this cell, this cell, and this cell in terms of the other stuff that it has in it. Eventually, or ultimately, where this cell was in the original kind of on the, on the axes of this original three-dimensional um, cell, it determines the type of cell or the fate it will be down the road. Now that's an overly simplistic explanation, uh, but we'll get into more of the details later. But the point is, we're, from the very first division, we're sending these cells down uh, a line of fate uh, in terms of determining what they will be eventually. So. During these early stages, called the cleavage stage, our overall volume doesn't change, but our number of cells greatly increases. So we're getting a bunch of cells that are just smaller. So the cleavage stage takes us to eventually a hollow ball of cells called the blastula. Uh, it's three-dimensional, so we do a cross-section. We see it's hollow. This empty space on the inside is called the blastocele. At some point, the blastocele rolls in on itself in a process called gastrulation. This creates for us two germ layers and a new body cavity. The blastocele still exists. This cavity that's here, let me get a pen, this cavity that's here, this empty space is still here, and it still exists here, but we're folding in and creating a new cavity. This cavity here, this space is called the archenteron. The archenteron is our primitive gut. It's the beginnings of the digestive system. We're also creating now two layers of cells, an inner layer, 
or endoderm, and the outer layer, the blue ectoderm. Eventually, we're going to break off some cells and start to form a middle layer of cells called mesoderm. These three original germ layers, or our primary germ layers, will eventually give rise to different systems. For example, the ectoderm will be responsible for giving rise to all of our skin and the epidermal or, or, or epithelial layers of the, the organs, and also the nervous system. The endoderm will give rise to the digestive tract, the gut, and the endocrine glands, and the mesoderm, the middle layer of, of, of tissue, will give rise to the skeletal systems, muscle systems, connective tissues, kind of the middle parts of the body. Here's a chart with more details on terms of which the, the three different germ layers and what um, tissues they will eventually give rise to. You have this in your note packet. Now, once we have these three germ layers, these three layers of cells, we have to talk about how the cells differentiate uh, further and how they morph and fold and, and, and twist into the, uh, the form of the, uh, the eventual body of the animal. The process of cell differentiation in terms of how cells become different types, muscle cells versus skin cells versus nerve cells, etc., uh, has to do with the fact that while each of these cells has the same genetic content, they don't use the entire instruction manual. So if you think of the DNA of a cell uh, being, instead of a single instruction manual, being a library filled with instruction manuals, it's easy to see where in some types of cells you use different parts of the library and other parts of the library are closed down. And in this specific pattern of closing down some parts of the genetic library and keeping other parts open, we get cells of different types. And once a cell type is formed, once parts of its instruction library shut down and others are opened up, all the cells that descend from that cell have the same pattern of kind of open library sections versus closed library sections so that skin cells give rise to skin cells and muscle cells give rise to muscle cells, etc. This differentiation, this process of becoming genetically different, while they have the same genetic content, they're not using uh, their entire genetic content and we get different cell types. Um, we'll talk about some other specific examples of um, this differentiation in class. Now once we have these different cell types, we have to change our, our morphogenesis or change of shape. Uh, we have to group these uh, specific in a very specific pattern of orderly changes in different size and shape and proportions to uh, create the actual body that we see as a result, the embryo from a ball of cells. This results in specialized tissues and organs that are at the right locations and come about at the right times. Uh, this is a very complex topic and we're going to hit the tip of the tip of the iceberg uh, in terms of explaining this. Um, for the scope of this course, uh, that's the, all we need. Of course, this is going to require cell divisions, active cell migrations, movement of cells, tissue growth and foldings, changes in cell size and shape, and also program cell death. Uh, this is stuff we're going to talk about in more great detail uh, in class. It doesn't work so well in the video form here. Like I said, we're going to leave these topics for in-class discussion because you're going to have lots of questions, I assume, and so uh, I think it's better done in, in class. So I'll hold off on that for now. After we do talk about this pattern formation, this, this morphogenesis, this change of shape or creation of shape, um, we're going to talk about specific organogenesis or the genesis of organs. Uh, again, this is something that was done better in class, but we'll use neurulation or the forming of the neural tube as a specific example. And we can quickly show a picture of this where our body is starting to form and we have our three germ layers. The, the yellow represents the endoderm, the red here represents the mesoderm, and the blue is the ectoderm. But at some point later after these form, the ectoderm is going to roll in on itself again in a process called neurulation and to form the neural tube. And this neural tube will give rise to the entire nervous system. So there's our introduction to animal development, uh, leaving all the hard stuff for, for in class. At least we get a preview of what we're going to be studying in the next few uh, class sessions. I will leave you with this thought. Going from this to this is miraculous. There's millions and millions of steps that have to occur and billions or trillions of cells that have to be formed in the right place at the right time to do the right function. In some ways, it's a mystery that it works ever, but we're lucky that it does.